it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Bloody Shores, My Corpse Child Part 1 The shit I did for my job, let me tell you. I love to write. I used to write for the school newsletter back in high school. In college, I actually earned my associates in creative writing. But I just decided to stick through high school instead of taking the first offer a journaling outlet hurled at me to come on full-time with them. I could have easily made it out with my bachelor's, if not even my master's degree. Well, it would have kept me out of what happened too, more than likely. Well, I guess it's a good thing I was involved the way I was. I'll say right now that none of the names have been changed of those that were involved in this. Well, at least any of the people I actually knew. If what I've seen escalates the way I fear it might, trust me, you'll be glad that you're reading this. I already tried publishing this story to Porterhouse Press for their magazine, but they said they won't accept it, claiming it's just too unrealistic and insensitive to families of the victims. <laughs> Ironic, if you ask me, given they were the ones to assign me the project in the fucking first place. Well, I guess their reach has gotten to them, too. Okay, now that's out of the way. Here's what happened. I want to say it was about early to mid-summer of 2018 that the first body cropped up on the beach at Sunny Shore Resort, or at least the first body people noticed. A giant panic had started over it, as you'd figure it would. The body, a man by the name of Eugene Lester, had seemingly washed up onto the outer edge of the beachfront when he was found in the middle of the afternoon. As the story goes, according to the mass media coverage of the incident at the time, a couple of kids ran screaming to their parents, crying that there was a shark in the water when they'd found Eugene's body, evidently having been shredded all to bits. And the parents asked where they'd found the supposed shark attack victim, and they then led them to Eugene's body. The parents, now obviously hysterical, alerted both the lifeguard and the local police to the scene, resulting in the closing of the beach for the rest of the afternoon. The beach stayed closed, too, until 7am the next morning. That's right, possible shark attack, and, you know, finding a fucking mutilated body wasn't reasonable enough cause to keep the beaches closed until they could assure the public's safety. For whatever reason, though, this was just swept under the rug for the most part, too. Beach goers and tourists couldn't give less than a single damn in the world, so long as they can get their tan on. Well, in any case... Things were smooth sailing again afterwards, until about a month later, when another incident was seen on the news. This time it was two bodies, lying face down in the sand, torn apart like they'd just been passed through a paper shredder. They were teenagers, 17-year-old Francis Wheeler and 19-year-old Rhonda Casquillo. Both of them, just like Eugene, were only ID'd by dental records. And from what I heard... Even that was a challenge because of how few teeth there were left in the mouths. Now, the biggest difference here is that while Eugene Lester had at least been found relatively in one piece, Francis and Rhonda were not so lucky. With them, it was just their heads and about half of their torsos apiece. This would be when Sunny Shore would, of course, have to close off the beach for the rest of the year. I'll say real quick, though, that I doubt they'd have kept it closed like they did if it didn't happen near the end of summer anyways. Investigations into the murders were brief at best. Like I said, I didn't have to be Batman to look at a couple of scraps of meat on the sand and say, Yep, shark attacks, case closed. People seemed to accept this too, which was why there was no public outcry against the police as to why there were no real investigations. This, however wasn't enough to quell the outrage about why they never bothered to take any real proper safety measures to ensure more people wouldn't fall victim to shark attacks. Even this was basically waved off by saying they'd take better precautions next year to ensure the safety of the public. In other words, sorry people were massacred here, and even though we knew, or at least should have known, it was unsafe for patrons, well, we opened the beach anyways. My bad. <laughs> Won't happen again, Pinky promise. And of course, they actually bought it. So, okay, you're probably wondering now, well, 
Did they make good on their word? Was the beach safe to return to in the summer of 2019? Well, to that I answer with a question of my own. Would I be here telling you this shit now if that were the case? Thus far, everything's been smooth sailing, right? No incidents, no dismembered bodies spontaneously washing out from the ocean. Just a smooth three weeks of fun at the sunny shore resort with the entire beachfront packed slam full with tourists and vacationers having a grand old time kicking off the summer. Everyone was carefree and willing to put the incidents of 2018 behind them and move on, believing that surely they made good on their word to make sure the beaches were safe this year, right? And the first week of July rolls around with... You guessed it, another body. This time it was a 25-year-old aspiring model for Paramore Quarterly named Rita Kettle. Would-be Mrs. Paramore 2019 was found early morning on the same outer edge of the beach as the other three, missing everything but half a torso. Fortunately, the sharks didn't seem to want much else of her, otherwise her fingerprints lifted from her right palm wouldn't have ID'd her. With this, of course, came once again the masses crying foul at Sunny Shore Resort Administration and the authorities, and once again, they simply waved everything off as shark attacks. While this wouldn't have raised any eyebrows with any other people who'd already been speculating that something else was behind the killings, it would raise eyebrows with the public in general. By mid-July, there was a distinct lack of patrons soaking in the sun along the beachfront at Sunny Shore. Day by day, the number dwindled. Where before you'd likely have had a hell of a time trying to find a spot to lounge along the beach, now you'd be lucky to see any more than two, maybe three hundred patrons, and I was pushing it, out at any given moment. People were afraid there were sharks in the water, and weren't about to get suckered by another empty promise again. Though, as I said, it wasn't closed at any point, and enough people would still come out to catch the sun, and in turn... For some, an early funeral. The next few bodies were found within only a week of each other. Each one was more horrifically mauled than the other. None of them were found, though, well, not reported anyways, until the week after. This was the point when the public stopped believing the constant shark attack story, given the frequency of the deaths and the fact that these individuals were apparently among the masses who weren't fond of the ocean. This means it was unlikely they'd have been near the water at any point during their stay at Sunny Shore. That's when a new possibility was brought into question. Could there be a serial killer on the loose of the beach? This forced the beach to close down once again. This time it was made clear that until either a suspect was apprehended, or until it was clear that sharks were no longer any sort of issue, Sunny Shore Resort would not be opening again to the public. And that was that. The rest of 2019, Sunny Shore Resort remained closed. It was hoped, of course, that everything would have blown right over by 2020. But not only had authorities found any suspects fitting the murders, but even if they had, well, the lockdown would have scared people away from wanting to vacation at Sunny Shore Resort. So, 2020 and 2021 also passed by without a word from Sunny Shore about when it might be opening the beaches back up again. By that point, I'm pretty sure most believe they weren't. It's entirely likely, too, that they'd lost interest, having had to remain indoors for almost two years. At least at home, there was no risk of ending up a shredded hunk of meat baking under the sun. Imagine, then, the surprise everyone felt when, at the beginning of the week, word spread through CNN and across social media that Sunny Shore Resort was finally going to be reopening its doors to the public at the beginning of June. Even though no word had spread yet of any arrests for the prior murders or anything, the authorities gave them the green light. And with that, people decided to give Sunny Shore one last chance. Obviously not without a sense of caution or controversy going around, though. Over the two years, the place remained destitute. A small rumour began starting to go around about the Sunny Shore slasher. While admittedly it wasn't a huge rumour in itself, at least not in my opinion, was enough for media and magazine outlets to want coverage and information on the topic. Magazines like World of Weird. This is where I come into the picture. See, I've been doing small path pieces as a freelancer for World of Weird Quarterly for about a year and a half by that point. 
I was midway into my sophomore year of college, and I wanted to be really able to solidify my writing career with them. So when they offered me this chance, having garnered a small bit of praise for the aforementioned puff pieces, I, of course, said yes. I will say, though, that I was curious as to why this case, in particular, was so interesting to them, given that most of their content dealt with mysteries surrounding supernatural phenomena or strange, unexplainable occurrences. Basically, think of the dollar store version of Ripley's Believe It or Not. They told me that part of it was that they wanted to see if there even was such a thing as the Sunny Shore Slasher, and if so, how hasn't he been caught, and why were the authorities so lax with letting the place open back up again, despite never having caught the guy? Well, that, and because we'd also been running into a dry spell with new material, we were also just taking anything we could even get at this point. Fair enough, I figured. And that's how I got involved with what I have affectionately dubbed the Sunny Shore Resort Incident. It was around the first Friday in June that I got to the beach. It was about a three and a half to four hour long drive to Sunny Shore Resort, from where I lived in Mount Holly, North Carolina. It probably would have taken me longer to get there if traffic were like it was two years ago before the rumours of the Sunny Shore Slasher. As it was, though, there was essentially no real traffic to speak of outside of the normal day-to-day fare. Folks, I guess, just weren't as hyped as we'd hoped that the beach was opening back up again. That made me a bit worried about how much I was going to be able to dig up about the whole situation. This idea was solidified a bit further when I saw that the car lots were all but barren, save a few hundred cars here and there. Ah, great. Real interesting story is going to be found here, I thought, as I got out and made my way to the reception desk to book a room for the week. The woman at the reception desk looked like just about every stereotypical desk jockey does in the movies. Tired and wanting to be literally anywhere else than stuck behind a piss yellow counter, staring at a computer screen all day for a joint that, like just about all accounts, shouldn't have been operational. One room for the week, please, I said as enthusiastically as I could. She looked at me, eyes almost glazed, zombie-like. Let me see what I have a vacancy for, she said, sighing. I chuckled awkwardly and said, oh, It doesn't have to be anything too fancy. <laughs> she just ignored me and continued clacking away at her keyboard. Looks like we got an opening for one along the beachfront, she said. Oh, that's perfect. All right, and you said you were planning to stay for a week? Yes, ma'am. She began typing on her keyboard again and asked me my name and date of birth. Maxwell Davidson, February 13th, 1998. She typed that in and I remarked, well, You can just call me Maddie, though. I tried to snicker at this. It was an old in-joke my girlfriend would use to tease with me. Clearly it wasn't working on this chick, judging from the look on her face that said, Really, dude? With that, I just lowered my head and waited for her to do her thing so I could go in. She got out the reservation book and told me to initial and date the specified boxes. That'll be two hundred and seventy-six fifty. Will it be cash, check, or card? Uh, card, I replied. I took out the company card given to me by the world of weird and paid for the room. Yes, it was an all-expense-paid venture. You seriously thought I'd pay almost three hundred bucks for this trip out of my own pocket? Hell no. She then handed me the keys and I sped walked out of the office area to my car without another word. The address on the key had me in room three of the Sunny Shore Suite building. Once I was at the resort, I went in and parked in front of the suite before grabbing my camera and journal and heading out to the beach. It was already getting to six o'clock by that point. The sun was going down and I wanted to get started gathering as much information on the story as I could as early on as possible so I figured I'd hold off for the time being on getting all set up in the room and all. When I got down to the beach, the air was a smooth breeze, and the sun was already a quarter of the way gone. In other words, the weather was perfect, relaxing even, yet there were still maybe about a hundred or so people out on the beach. Now, I bet you're probably thinking, well, yeah, but who usually lies on the beach at that time of night? You're not going to soak in the sun if there's no sun. Fair point, except for the fact that, again, Sunny Shore was known to be a slam full from dust through dawn. 
Regardless, I started snapping some pictures for the piece, particularly looking for any unnatural or out-of-place aspects of the beachfront. Aspects such as a significantly secluded area that would serve as a dumping site, or maybe even a hideout for the mysterious Sunny Shore Slasher. Needless to say, though, no such place turned up. Everything was more or less calm, relaxing. Still, the scenery was nice enough, so I started snapping pictures anyways. If nothing else, I figured, it'd be nice to have a few pics of just the beach itself to go with the story. Of course, that meant I actually had to find a story. With this in mind, I decided to start asking a few of the patrons on the beach for their thoughts. The first was an older, overweight, hairy-looking guy chowing down on one of the chili dogs from the nearby hot dog stands. Excuse me, sir, I asked. He didn't even look at me, too busy stuffing his fat cheeks with chili. So, um, I was wondering. See, I'm not from around here. I was wondering, is it true what they say about this place? This time he looked at me, now still full and dripping with meat and bean juice. What's it do you? He responded, spewing chunks of food at me with every word out of his mouth. I sighed, wiping off a soggy bit of bread and meat mush that landed in my face. Really, asshole? Well, as collected as I could manage, I forced a smile and said, I was just curious to know if you think it's true what people are saying about there being a possible maniac on the loose. Well, Fatso just continued glaring at me, chomping his chili dog. Yeah, I believe there's something out there, he snapped, spewing more food at me. I wiped my face off again and asked him what he meant. Well, it ain't no man. What? I asked, raising my eyebrows. He looked around anxiously before telling me to come closer to whisper in my ear. And I hesitated. Even if I was afraid of Big Brother or whatever, I'd rather deal with that than have this joker spewing literal shit in my ear. I waited for him to swallow his mouthful before leaning in to listen to him. I think there's uh, something else going on, he whispered. I don't think it was a man that did that to them folks way back then. What are you talking about? What did it then? I was understandably more than a little confused. I think something in the ocean's been getting up. Why, oh, you mean like sharks? You think the rumors about them being shark attacks were real? Hey, I thought you said you weren't from around here, he whispered suspiciously. Look, I'm not. Like I said, I've heard about the rumors surrounding this place, and, well, I figured... I got no further. Ah, you're with them, ain't you? You're a goddamn secret operative or something, ain't you? What? N no, no, I... Yeah, I see what's going on here. You're trying to figure out what I know so you can take me away, ain't you? He started backing away from me, even cradling the last quarter of his chili dog to him like it was an infant. Sir, wait, I... But before I could do anything else, Fatso was already lumbering down the beach yelling, You won't probe my mind. Oh, great, off to an amazing start here, I said to myself, sighing. The sun was sinking further and further, Many of the already few patrons that were even on the beach had by that point left. There were, however, a group of three other younger-looking folks who hopefully weren't paranoid fucks who didn't know better than to talk with their mouths full. Well, I was sort of right. They were young, and none of them were stuffing their faces with chili dogs or anything, but they were all but stoned out of their minds. Yo, what's up? One of them, a lanky-looking kid with dreads, called out as I approached. The others turned to look at me, also calling out, Yeah, what's up? Oh, I sighed again. Another group of geniuses. Hey guys, uh, mind if I ask you a few questions? They started laughing while also scrambling to snuff out the joint they had. Guys, it's alright, I'm not a cop. The first one stopped and his foot raised to stamp out the joint. He stooped back down to draw it back out of the sand before taking another drag of it. So, um, yeah, not from around here. I was wondering, is it true what the news has been saying about this place? They all exchanged glances back and forth between each other before looking back at me, giggling. 
I rolled my eyes. <sighs> this was getting me nowhere. I think they tried saying something, but between all the giggling and oh shit, for real banter, I couldn't make out heads or tails of a damn bit of it. One thing I fortunately was able to make out was a vague detail about the sunny shore slasher usually coming out at night. Again, it was vague and frankly kind of cliché, but it was also the only consistent detail of the differing stories that they'd stick with, between different variants of the guy either being a disgruntled vagrant, a pissed-off ex-resort employee, as well as the last one claiming he was some sort of Jason Voorhees knockoff, an undead killer back from the dead after drowning in the beach. For professional purposes, I went ahead and jotted down what I could of these stories including Fatso's half-baked conspiracy about whatever it was being from the ocean. If nothing else, regardless of whether there was any credibility surrounding the Sunny Shore Slasher, or any of the stories surrounding him or not, then I could at least provide a small piece on the effect of hysteria that such rumours caused. One way or another, I'd have a story. By the time the three stoners were finished barraging me with different versions of their stories, the sun was completely gone, only the faintest light being shown over the horizon. I looked around, seeing nobody around besides us four. I thanked the three for their insight and began walking back to the condo. I was exhausted from the long drive and several hours wasted on the beach with essentially nothing to show. <sighs> Just time to get some rest. Tomorrow morning, I'd wake up and have a fresh throng of interviewees, once you might actually have a lick or two of damn sense. I made it back to the room, where I took a quick shower and whipped up some dinner. I sat down on the couch to eat when my phone buzzed. It was a text from Nolan. Nolan was sort of my sidekick on the project, offering to look into specific details about Sunny Shore Resort and its history, as well as any significant historical details about the surrounding area around the beach. It was a message from him asking if I'd made it yet. I told him I had just a couple of hours ago. Found anything yet? <sighs> Not really. You even started yet? Yeah, but nobody seems to know anything. Not anything useful anyways. What do you mean? Well, people think either this fucker's some sort of fish dude or Jason Voorhees. <laughs> you tell me. Well, really. Laugh my ass off. Yeah, fucking stupid, right? Makes me wonder if there's going to be anything worth trying to send off to him. What about any sorts of posters or banners or shit like that? What do you mean? What banners? You know, like, welcome to Sunny Shore Resort. Come visit our gift shop where we have the murder weapon used by the Sunny Shore Slasher himself. You know, shit like that. <laughs> no. I don't think they'll want to publicize it like that. Anyway, I'm going to try again tomorrow with a few of the other locals in the area. See if any of them know anything useful. All right, keep me posted. I'll keep seeing if there's anything interesting on my end. Okay, gotcha. I followed that with a thumbs up before putting the phone back down. After dinner, I decided to look over the little data I'd actually gathered, seeing if there maybe was something there that I didn't want to risk overlooking by accident. At present, I couldn't connect any real dots, except that something around the beach area was indeed killing people off, and that who or whatever it was definitely had something to do with the ocean. I was already getting the impression, given the obviously lax approach so far, that the authorities and the Sunny Shore Resort management knew something, something they, for whatever reason, didn't want the public getting wise to. But what? I decided I'd call it a night at that. I figured, well, what's the sense in burning out this early on, you know? I didn't have much, sure, but I could have at least considered what I had as start right. I planned to go to the management office the next morning and schedule a meeting with either the CEO of Sunny Shore Resort himself, Harvey Whittaker, or at the very least, one of the upper management representatives of the company. Basically, just anybody who'd have enough insight to tell me if there'd been any sort of history with any shady characters in the past, such as, say, an ex-employee or an ex-customer looking to get some sort of payback or something like that. The next morning, when it opened at around 8am, I went down to the office and was greeted by the tired-ass Tracy receptionist again. What can I do for you, sir? 
be grown. Yes, um, I'd like to speak with one of the administrators, please. She rolled her eyes and began clacking away at the keyboard. Well, it looks like Mr. Whitaker isn't in his office right now. Are there any of the other higher-ups I can speak to? She turned and typed on her keyboard before facing me again and telling me that there weren't any. Well, um, do you have any idea when he'll be back? She absently shook her head. If you like, I can take a message. Leave your name, phone number, and room number. If you're filing a complaint, I can also give you the number of HR. Well, I just forced a smile. Yeah, maybe I will complain, I thought, saying goodbye and leaving the office. No, I didn't actually call HR on her. What I did do, however, was head back down to the beachfront. Might not be a bad idea to try out the locals again. The sun was only about halfway up by that point, and I figured it'd be a few more hours before the idiots would swarm the beach again. The beach was calm again, just like last night. Obviously, there weren't many people around at all, but I wasn't as caught off guard this time. I know I said this place was usually stuffed to the gills, pun intended, but that wasn't usually until 12.30 or 1 o'clock, somewhere in that period. I started snapping pics again, wanting at least a variety of shots along the beachfront. Some of the nighttime sky, and now some of the early morning. If I was going to end up with nothing for the piece story-wise, then I'd at least have some kind of variety with the pics, right? So anyway, I stood for about 20 minutes snapping away photos, when I noticed at the far end of the beach, toward the boardwalk, a flock of seagulls clustering together at one central spot just a few feet away from the receding tide. Curious, I snapped a picture before walking that way to investigate. I noticed how all of their heads were bobbing up and down from the spot, picking at something. Well, they must be fighting over scraps of washed up fish or something like that. About a foot away from them, one of the gulls looked over and spotted me before spreading its wings and taking flight. The others soon followed, and that's when I was met up close for the first time with the sunny shore slasher's first victim of the year. The body, or maybe I should say just the torso, was covered in large, deep gashes that didn't leave any bit of it untouched. There were no arms or even a freaking head attached. No, just an armless, legless, headless hunk of meat, sitting there in the sand, having been a good deal picked away at by the gulls. I won't lie, I was sickened. Hell, it was everything I could do not to just up and dump my stomach right there on the beach. What the fuck had happened? Who is this and how long have they been here even? I looked around. Nobody even seemed to notice. God, what am I going to do? I wondered, panic starting to mount in my head. Yeah, sure, call the cops, obviously. But then what? What'll happen then? Best case scenario, they'll shut the place down again. Great. Then I'll have wasted the trip down here. I wasn't big on the idea of going back to world of weird empty-handed. But then again, what if they didn't? In fact, it seemed more likely to me that they wouldn't have given their options from the past. One dismembered carcass on the beach. <laughs> no biggie. Three or four. Then the authorities are concerned. In the end, I'll go ahead and say right now that I'm not entirely proud of doing this. Disrespectful to the dead and all, I guess. I took a few pictures of the remains before running from the site and back to the condo. As soon as I got inside my room, I bolted the door and drew all the curtains before picking up the phone and frantically dialing 911. 911 dispatch, what is your emergency? Yeah, hello, yeah, my name's Maxwell Davidson. I'm in Sunny Shore Resort and I need to report a murder. Okay, and... You said you were at the resort? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sir, and can you tell me where you saw this take place? Uh, it was on the beach, ma'am. I didn't see the murder. I only found the body. I see. Uh, and you didn't see anyone fleeing the scene? No, no ma'am, I didn't. I found it just a few minutes ago. It's still there, though. All right, sir. I'm sending a unit there now. Are you somewhere safe? Yeah, yeah, I'm in my room in the Sunny Shore Suite. Okay, and are there any sharp weapons on you? 
Is the door unlocked? Um, yeah. Good. I want you to sit tight where you are. A unit is being sent to your location now. The line cut off after that. I was confused. Why was she asking me if I had any sharp weapons? Why did that matter? I mean, yeah, I knew sometimes they'd ask that for safety reasons, but I thought that was only done if they were suspicious of you or if you were the one calling to confess to something like this. Granted, I never really knew much of standard police protocol, but still, something about that made me worried. I realized, though, that I told them that I didn't actually see who or what did it. That means whoever did it is lurking around the beach somewhere, possibly even in the suite. Even if they weren't suspecting me, that would mean I wasn't safe stepping out of the room. I went ahead and unlocked the door, but remained braced against it. Once I heard the knock of the police, I figured I could open the door then. While I was waiting, I went ahead and started sending the pictures to Nolan. Dude, I just found this. What is this? Is this a body? Yeah. What the fuck? Where? When? Who? No, I don't know. I was out on the beach again this morning and there it was. Have you caught the police? Yeah, I just did. They're on the way. Now, listen, I need you to print out copies of those pictures for the story, okay? Um, I mean, okay, yeah, but... What? I mean, isn't that kind of fucked up? Look, I know, I know. But I'm going to have to end up giving the ones I took over to the cops when they get here. Dude, I can't really explain it, but something tells me they wouldn't exactly be big on the idea of showing any of this or letting anything reach the public. This might be the only way this isn't completely lost forever, you know. Yeah, alright man. Just please don't go pissing off the wrong people with this. I can't handle another snafu like what happened with your little stint at Area 51. I rolled my eyes. Ah, oh, he was always teasing me with that one. God, it was one fucking time. Look, I'll be fine. Just print those off for me. That way, if nothing else, we'll have at least something to show for the project. I was jolted up when I heard the knock at the door. I slowly stood up and looked through the peephole. Sure enough, it was two female officers standing at my door. I opened it. Uh, hello? Maxwell Davidson? The lead officer asked. Yeah. We're with the Mecklenburg County PD. We're responding to a call about a body being discovered. I noticed her starting to peek around the room from the doorway. Yeah, on the beach, I replied, growing somewhat nervous now. She looked back at me. Okay, could you step outside for us, please? The other officer asked. I hesitated. Um, why? The two of them fixed me with a cold stare, the kind that told me without telling me that they really weren't in the mood to ask me twice. Stay outside, sir, the lead repeated, somewhat harsher than before. I stepped outside, shaking. Before I knew it, the partner was walking into the suite. Hey, what the hell are you... I was cut off when the lead officer began hemming me against the wall. Hey, what is this? What are you doing? Maxwell Davidson, you have the right to remain silent, as anything you say or do can and will be... What the hell? What are you talking about? Oh, am I being arrested? I got no answer for this. Instead, she continued to cuff me, while I heard the partner tearing through my room. The fuck? I exclaimed. What the fuck are you two doing? The partner came out of the room holding my camera. Hey, that's my camera. Move it, sir, barked the lead officer harshly. I was then shoved down the hallway and out of the suite. Once out, I was rudely shoved in the back of the police cruiser before being driven to the station about 10 to 15 minutes away from Sunny Shore Resort. Once there, I was essentially dragged out of the cruiser into the station before being thrown into a chair. Hey, easy. What the hell's going on? The lead officer sat in the chair across from me. She began laying out photos. Look, this is a mistake, I exclaimed. 
There's a maniac out there and you're harassing me. You recognize any of these folks? Her voice was monotone, cold and blunt. I looked at the photos. They were all of shredded human remains, all having been found on the beach. What the fuck? No, I haven't seen these people before. The two officers glared at me. What? I didn't do this. How could I? How? The lead officer asked. Well, the way I understand, you had no trouble offing that poor bastard you confessed on the phone about. What? Confessed? I didn't confess to shit. I was about to jump from my chair when I watched the partner reaching for something in her belt. Yeah, I'd advise keeping yourself in check there, boy, she said coldly. I didn't kill anybody, okay? I saw that body and immediately called you. Oh, really? The lead officer asked. The first thing you did, huh? She held up my camera. So you decided after you called us to start snapping pictures of your latest accomplishment? What? No, I didn't. So here's the story as I understand it. You, after all this time, come around here after we finally get the place opened back up again, just to start up your little killing spree once again. What? I screamed. The partner reared back to her belt again. What the fuck are you talking about? I didn't kill anyone. She turned to her partner. Yeah, that'd sound about right to me. What about you? The partner just kept eyeing me, nodding in agreement. I couldn't have killed them. I don't know them. Hell, I've never even seen those fuckers before in my life. Give me one good reason why I'm supposed to believe you. What do you mean? I already told you. I called you right after I found that body. Your latest victim, you mean? She asked. My body began shaking violently. God damn it. Have you heard a single word I've said? I did not kill anybody. Oh, the maniac's still out there. Why are you taking their pictures? The partner asked, still glaring daggers at me. You press? No, I mean, well, not... You shooting a movie, is that it? You trying to shoot a snuff film? Oh, the fuck... Do you people hear yourselves? A snuff film, really? So you admit it was for your sick collection? The lead officer asked. No, I shouted, this time bolting from the chair. I was ready to wrap my hands around both their throats and start shaking the hell out of them to make them freaking listen to me. The only reason I didn't was because as soon as I was on my feet again, Miss Trigger Happy Partner drew her gun and aimed it directly between my eyes. You know, this isn't exactly helping your case here, the lead officer chided. I stayed locked in a staring match with the partner for another minute and a half before diverting my eyes back to the lead officer. I then closed my eyes and inhaled. Oh, look, I took those pictures because I'm here with a magazine company. The lead officer glanced over to her partner. The partner just remained focused on me. I thought you said you weren't with the press. I'm not. We're just a startup. What magazine? She asked, using air quotes. World of Weird. <laughs> Never heard of it. She looked at her partner again, and again the partner wouldn't take her eyes or her gun away from me as she shook her head. <sighs> he probably wouldn't. Like I said, startup journaling house. Just started back in late 2017. We haven't picked up much traction. Why they send you? Why here? Well, to find the same thing you're looking for, more or less. What do you mean? I was sent here to see if there was any truth to the stories. I only heard about them myself just a couple of weeks ago when I was given the assignment. Like I've been saying, I'm not even from around here. So they sent an out of town here to the resort on some sort of journalism snipe hunt. I noticed she had this weird sort of reassurance in her voice when she said this. Like she was glad to hear that I was an out-of-towner on a snipe hunt. Um, yeah, sure, yeah, but, but I don't, um... She stood up and waved for the partner to take her gun off me. All right, Mr. Davidson, you're free to go. Sorry for any inconvenience. We'll be escorting you back to the resort. I stood dumbly. 
What? <laughs> you were right. We jumped the gun there. We will, however, be keeping your little camera here. Don't need you going around trying to spook folks around here when it's clearly nothing but a shark attack. Wait, what? I exclaimed. But I need my camera. She just looked at me with a shit-eating smirk and replied, Again, give my regards to Planet of Bizarro Land or whatever. The two then left before two more officers came in and escorted me out to the cruiser to take me back to the resort. On the ride back, one thing kept repeating in my mind. That was too easy. Everything about that situation was wrong. For starters, despite being so quick to supposedly believe I'd done it, then confess over the phone, they never tried making me show them where I'd even found the body. Not only that, but they were so quick to let me go after I told them about World of Weird, readily dismissing me as just a wingnut spouting bullshit and writing off yet another murder as just another shark attack. To top all of that off, they were adamant about keeping their camera, just to be able to keep to this story. In other words, I couldn't tell whether they, themselves, actually believed in the legends of the Sunny Shore Slasher, or if they were just trying to shut everybody up. One thing I was 100% certain of, though, was that there was definitely something they didn't want me to see, and it definitely had something to do with the body. Part 2 When we got back to Sunny Shore, I was dropped off, being left with a warning. Word to the wise. Next time, just remember that sharks tend to feed at night here. That's all. Got it? I didn't reply, nor did they wait for one before speeding off. Immediately, I scurried back to my condo. It was about three o'clock or so by that point. Still enough time to try and figure out what I was going to do next. I will say one thing. Those cops might have been desperate and wildly extreme in their approach, but thank God they were so desperate that they never thought to take my phone. Not only that, but thank God I was forward-thinking enough to go ahead and send the pictures they confiscated to Nolan. At least now I'm not completely starting from scratch. Nolan Peters, the human thumb drive. But regardless, I still begged the other question. How was I supposed to proceed going forward? I found when I came back in the room, to both my dismay and utter chagrin, that during her little rampage through my suite, Mrs. Trigger Happy went and also smashed the absolute shit out of my $400 laptop. Yeah, thanks, bitch. Not only that, but without the camera, the best quality I'd have been able to get was whatever my Nokia from back like in 2013 could manage. Not exactly ideal for someone like me who was trying to make a foothold with an up-and-coming journalism outlet. Especially not if I was trying to be taken seriously. It was bad enough they were going to extremes just to shut me up. Of course then, what exactly were my options? To simply give up and say, fuck this place, and go back home? Well, they'd win. Whoever and why they're doing it, they'd win. Suppressing the truth, whatever it may be. And those that died, they get thrown under the rug as a bunch of unlucky nobodies who were swept under that rug, effectively forgotten about. No, I'd find a way to keep going with this. Either that or I'd make a way. The first thing I did was to try call Nolan to tell him what was going on. And because I have a feeling I know what you're about to say. Yes, I'm well fucking aware they could have been tapping the phones. But I needed someone to know, even if it wasn't the public as a whole. Should I go missing or whatever? As it happened, it was straight to voicemail, all three times. I ended up leaving a message. Hey man, it's me, Max. Um, listen, um, I need you to make sure those pictures I sent you don't go anywhere. Shit's gotten fucking crazy around here. I don't know what it is, but for a fact, they don't want the public to know about it. So yeah, just, well, if anything happens, anything takes a jog sideways... I need you to make sure that stuff makes it into the hands of World of Weird, okay, man? Thanks. After that, I decided to make a little bit of food before trying to go back out onto the beach. A, because I was starving. I guess being arrested and harassed can work up that kind of appetite, huh? B, because I just figured, well, 
having only just gotten let go for poking around too much, it'd be wise to lay low at least for another couple of hours before trying to go out and start snapping away. It was about 5am when I decided to head back out again. Another detail that occurred to me, thinking back to the other cases as well as the one from earlier, was that whatever was happening to these folks was happening overnight. That would mean that if I were to catch anything interesting, it was most likely to be at night time. I just hope the flash on this piece of junk works. So back out on the beach I went. Like the previous night, there was next to absolutely nobody around on the beach. I started walking along the surf, constantly looking back and forth over my shoulder to see if either Mrs. Trigger Happy or her CO were keeping eyes on me. The sun was quickly sinking below the horizon again decided to pay attention to the tide itself. If it was something from the water, I thought, I might have the best chance of spotting it by paying close attention to it. Of course, what exactly it was I was supposed to be looking for, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be looking for a person, the dorsal fin of a shark, or what. Then from the distance across the horizon, I began to hear it. It was strange at first, Sounding like a mix between some sort of distant drumbeat and the sound of a humpback whale when it's doing a mating call, deep and echoing. I took out my phone and did my best to zoom in on where I thought the sound was coming from. I couldn't see anything at first, just the current rush of the night tide. Even maxing the zoom didn't help. There was nothing there. I looked around to see if any of the other 10 or 12 people that happened to actually be on the beach could hear it too. Sure enough, I wasn't the only one who could hear it. Though apparently I was the only one brave enough to stay where I was. All of them scrambled over each other, desperately trying to get away from the ocean. What the hell? What's going on? Why is everyone running? I looked back toward the ocean. I still couldn't see anything coming out of the water, but I did spot a sea of foam seeming to come from the area where the whalish sounds were coming from. The foam travelled on a direct path toward the shoreline. I snapped a picture of it and instantly texted it to Nolan. Even if it was nothing, it was evidently enough to scare the absolute hell out of these people. I could at least use that in whatever piece I'd be able to scrape together for this project, right? About halfway to the shoreline, I actually saw something emerge from the water. A fin. An actual fucking fin. Mind you, though, it wasn't the dorsal fin of a shark. No, this one was sort of webbed, the kind you'd find on trout or tuna. An actual saltwater fish, although neither of those was known for their ability to devour people like what was going on here. I squinted to try and get a closer look. The hell is that? I wondered, seeing the fin draw closer and closer. Whatever it was, it was moving fast didn't even take two minutes before the thing had made it almost right up onto the shoreline, almost right on fucking top of me from out in the middle of the ocean. I actually stumbled trying to backpedal away from it. It kept coming. Soon I finally saw more of the thing break the surface of the water. That's when I damn near had a heart attack. There, along the shoreline, standing around six and a half to seven fucking feet tall, and only about three feet away from me, was, was, well, fuck, it hurts to try imagining that thing again. Basically, think of the gill man, but if he was juicing every two hours before pumping mad iron, and then had these weird tentacle things that were coming out of his fucking back, covered in what looked like thorns, giving them an appearance similar to barbed wire, and well, well, in the words of Bill Paxton, Game over, man. Game over. Laid on my back in the sand, I couldn't move. I was frozen, every muscle in my body feeling like they'd been blasted with ice. The creature took two lumbering steps toward me. I kid you not when I tell you I could feel the ground tremble in fear beneath me with those two steps. The creature took two more steps toward me. Its marbled, globulous eyes beat down on me, bulging and twitching erratically. The creature's breathing was heavy, almost snarling, if fish can snarl. Boom. 
<laughs> Two rumbling steps more, driving the earth around me further and further toward an earthquake. My heart was skipping about five beats with each quaking step. Taking such huge strides like it was, the creature was soon looming over me. It looked straight down at me, like a grizzly looking down upon a wounded deer. Or rather a shark staring down at a guppy with his mouth caught on a big-ass hook. It wasn't until I heard this sort of screeching sound that sounded like ten nails being dragged across a blackboard while underwater coming from behind me that I even found it in me to turn the fuck around. Behind me were two hooded figures holding torches. Their hands were raised in the air, waving their torches almost in a sort of defensive manner at the creature. And the creature responded with a roar of its own, and I swear to fucking God caused an actual earthquake. I didn't know what the fuck I was supposed to do. And before you decide to be a wise ass and say, run, Forrest, run, keep in mind I was essentially cut off. Even if I could have made myself move, there was no telling how quickly the behemoth fishman thing would have snatched me right back up and planted my ass right back on the ground. Never mind, of course, the druid standing behind me. They continued waving their torches at it, screeching. This went on back and forth between them for the better part of a minute before I watched them step closer to us. The creature did not move. One of its twitching eyes remained fixed on me, while the other was deadlocked on the druids like a friggin' chameleon. Then, from further off in the distance, behind the druids, I heard another, slightly deeper screeching sound, accompanied by what sounded like a woman screaming. No! I heard her cry. Let me go! Looking closer, I saw another figure, taller than the two figures behind me. And, at least at first glance, it appeared to be wearing a weird fish mask that looked similar to the creature. He had one hand raised in the air, with the other firmly grasping the struggling woman. I heard him cry out again, and the creature responded with another earth-shaking roar of its own. The masked figure approached the two hooded ones, dragging the woman behind almost effortlessly, despite her seemingly fighting for dear life. My heart sped up when I saw who the would-be victim was. It was the receptionist, Tired Tracy. Oh, holy mother of... They're not about to... She screamed out again for her captor to let go, but he paid her no attention, drowning out her screaming with his own screeches. Tired Tracy tried scratching at the man's face, only to have her arm twisted, causing her to cry out in pain. I was confused... Frightened, dumbfounded, frankly, as well as just straight up fucking panicking. I was at a complete loss for what I was supposed to do. I knew I couldn't just sit there and watch as they would just up and feed her to this thing. It looked like they were about to do this. I didn't like the chick, sure, but I didn't want to see her become live bait either. But then, what the hell was I supposed to do? Even if this thing wasn't built like the Incredible Hulk and a baby with Ursula from The Little Mermaid... It was still four against one. And pathetic as this might sound, being a dude, I'm no kind of fighter. I didn't have any weapons with me either. Just my phone and the clothes on my back. Phone. That's when I looked up and realized that the creature's left eye was no longer watching me. Now its attention was fixed solely upon its impending supper. I took my phone out then, making sure the flash was on, given that the sun had just about disappeared entirely, and snapped photos of the scene around me. I basically started snapping away, not at all trying to focus on anything in particular. This was done for two reasons. First, obviously, for proof that what I was seeing here wasn't some sort of pipe dream or hallucination or something like that. The second was to hopefully divert their focus away from tired Tracy enough for her to possibly break free and run. Well, sure enough, this actually sort of worked, though it proved just how little I'd thought this plan out. I'd taken about 15 or 20 pictures with my phone before I realized they were all now staring at me. Fish Hulk, the Mars Man, and the two druids, all of them now glaring right at me. With this, Tired Tracy wrenched her wrist free from the man's grip and took off back toward the sweet building. She was free, but now I was screwed. 
Four of them now had their sights set on me, and I could tell they were fucking pissed. I wasn't entirely clear on what the heck was going on, but I wasn't an idiot. This was apparently some human sacrifice ceremony, and I'd just gotten myself knee-deep in it where I evidently didn't belong. I looked around. Everywhere around me, I was cut off except for directly behind me. Thinking quickly, I chucked my phone at the masked man. What else was I supposed to use? Again, no weapon, before turning and booking it in the opposite direction. I couldn't hear them, but I wasn't about to dare risk turning around to look behind me. I had to have been gunning it at least 50 miles per hour. At least, how I felt anyway. Didn't know where I was heading either. Well, I couldn't think about that. Hell, I could barely even think at all, aside from, Oh, please God, don't let these fucking things catch me. Sure enough, God was actually listening. After uh, maybe another five or ten minutes, for a total of close to twenty minutes straight, of running blindly, exhausting myself to the point where I was ready to collapse face first in the sand, I looked back to see the coast appeared to be clear. They hadn't chased after me. Just about enough breath in me to allow myself a laugh of relief before I did end up falling to my side on the beach. The adrenaline wore off almost as quickly as it came, and only five seconds after collapsing, my ass was out like a busted light. It was morning before I woke up again. It was two of the stoner kids from before. Dude, like, are you still alive? One of them asked, looking like he'd just seen the face of God and was about to have the secrets of the universe told to him. Uh, what, what the fuck? What happened? Oh, you were wiped the fuck out, my dude. Another kid squealed excitedly. I looked around. Everything looked so fuzzy and clouded. Yeah, where am I? I asked. On the boardwalk, the first one replied again. Bro, I think the man wigged out a little too hard last night, the other exclaimed. He pulled the joint he was puffing on from behind his ear and extended it to me. Yeah, here, dude, take a puff. Helps you loosen up. I looked at him groggily. Well, I won't lie, I was stuck between wanting to put my foot in all three of their asses just out of sheer annoyance and actually saying fuck it and taking the joint. About a minute later, I ended up doing neither of those things and instead stood up and started trying to stumble my way back to where I thought I remembered running from the previous night. Whether because of how exhausted I was or because of the utterly bizarre nature of what happened that night, my mind was in a bit of a weird haze. I couldn't remember much of anything outside of these small fragments of seeing fish people. Eventually, though, I actually managed to find my phone lying buried in the sand, right next to a big-ass footprint that no one was going to mistake as being a person's. That's when everything came flooding back to me, and I swiped my phone up from the sand. I tried dusting it off and turning it on, only to find that the battery was dead and the SIM card had been removed. Ah, oh, fuck. Well, that was it. I was screwed, essentially. Even getting the phone turned back on, I'd still lose all of the pictures from that night. I had the ones that had been sent to Nolan, sure, but no one was going to take that seriously. Just another shark attack. That'd be what they called it. Yeah, okay, it'd be a story, and yeah, I'd make a bit of cash from it. But that's not what the fuck happened here. I knew it. Tired Tracy sure as hell knew it, and I was willing to bet every penny to my name the police knew about it as well. That then became my next move. Find Tired Tracy and figure out what they were doing with her on the beach that night. I took a glance down at the footprint and back to the morning tide. I knew it wouldn't be long before that would be washed away. Oh, God damn it! What I wouldn't give to have my camera again. Part 3 I went back to the sunny shore suite, only to find someone else at the reception desk. This new girl was younger than tired Tracy, and much more perky, annoyingly so in fact. Well, hello there, sir. How can I help you? Oh, um, yeah, um, I was wondering, what happened to the lady that was here yesterday? Um, oh, her, well, um... She gave me a plastic sort of smile and giggled. She said she just didn't have the spirit for this anymore. 
But I'm here, and I hope I can make your stay with us unforgettable. I just stood there looking at her, wondering just how much ecstasy she'd bought before I walked into the building. Admittedly, this further started to freak me out. I mean, clearly something was up. Not only was tired Tracy gone, but the alibi on its own was suspicious as all hell, made even worse by the fact I had seen what had happened on the beach. Um, well, yeah, in that case, um, I'll be heading back to my room. I chuckled nervously before turning and heading toward the room. Behind me, I heard the new girl call out to me. Okay, if you need anything, sweetheart, I'm just a whisper away. I looked back briefly to see her standing at the other end of the hall, a big-ass grin and plastered on her face, waving at me like she was one of those inflatables at a car dealership. Ah, oh, freaky-ass receptionist now. Great. I got back in the room, slamming and locking the door after making sure I wasn't being followed by the freaky new girl, and stood for a moment in the middle of the room. I was stuck. I mean, the story was there. I saw it, but how the hell was I going to get others to? I couldn't take pictures anymore. I couldn't message Nolan. And I had no leads or witnesses. God, what am I supposed to do now? The answer, at least for the immediate time being, was to get another phone with a SIM card get it working again. If nothing else, I needed to re-establish contact with Nolan if I was going to, at least, have a shot of turning something in for World of Weird. I managed to pick up a relatively cheap burner phone and took the SIM card out of it before texting Nolan. Hey, uh, Nolan, it's me, Max. You there? It was about another twenty or so minutes before he replied. Hey, Max. New phone? Uh, sort of. Listen... Some crazy shit's gone down here since yesterday afternoon, okay? What kind of shit? Dude, if I try and explain it here, I'm gonna end up dropping a fucking brain hemorrhage, okay? Just trust me. It's beyond foobar here. Okay, why are you telling me this? Well, uh, you still got the pics I sent you earlier? Yeah. Oh, good. Look, I asked, man, because I believe that what I saw I wasn't supposed to, if you take my meaning. What? God damn it, Max. Didn't I tell you not to go pissing people off? Look, I didn't do a damn thing, okay? All I did was report the body to the police. Next thing I knew, my laptop was getting smashed, and I was getting dragged out of the suite in handcuffs. Wait, you were arrested? What the fuck, man? Why? I don't know. All I know is that after that, they confiscated my camera and the photos. Now, after what the fuck happened last night... A few extra pics I managed to snag are gone too. That's why I wanted to make sure you still had a copy of them. Well, what are you going to do now then? I sighed. Yeah, great fucking question. Honestly, man, for the moment I have absolutely no clue whatsoever. I'm kind of tapped out with options for the moment without my camera. That's when a light bulb went off in my head. Hey, uh, how busy are you for the next three or four days? I'm not. Half till Monday. Why? I've done just about everything I can here on my own. I was wondering, uh, you think you'd be game for coming down and checking this out with me? There wasn't a reply for another five to ten minutes after that. Funny enough, he almost wouldn't have needed to. God knows I could hear his response coming a fucking mile away. Something along the lines of, have you lost your damn mind? No, but I'm not far off it. You mean, now? Like, right now? Yeah. I mean, fuck man, I could. But I don't know how I feel about getting into some weird shit where I'd get arrested. You know, I'm still trying to get my degree right. I know, I know. Look, I'm not trying to see you get in any trouble, okay? Dude, something big is going on here. Trust me, if we can land this scoop, it'll be worth it. Yeah, alright. You've twisted my arm. Be there in half an hour. Awesome. Thanks, man. After that, I sat on the couch to wait. Past the time, I grabbed my notepad and began going over as many of the details of the case as I could remember. I started with the background details, such as the killings themselves and the rumor of the Sunny Shore Slasher. From there, I took note of the rumors I gathered from talking to the Stoner Gang and Old Fatso, with the individual conclusions being big government conspiracy on the one hand and some tribal shit on the other. The connection between the two, having been established by both the cops and the jury's actions of sabotage, was that, 
Whatever was going on with the mutant fishman, and whatever the hell was happening on the beach, they obviously didn't approve of prying curiosity and loose lips. I decided to include the details of human sacrifice on the beachfront as a side note, at least until I might be able to dig up a bit more of just who the fuck they actually are. No sense in trying to emphasize a detail that only looks weird, right? Well, I may be an amateur, but I'm not mystery fucking ink here. Uh, with all that laid out, I began planning what my next move was supposed to be. Obviously, the police were out of the question. I could have tried the locals again, sure. But even if I wasn't being watched, something I wasn't willing to bet on, I doubted there'd be even anyone on the beach. Not anybody with real answers, anyway. Now, my best hope at this point was to hope that Nolan brought a spare camera with him that we'll be able to get lucky enough to get another shot at getting Fishman and his little fan club and a couple of group photos. Well, at least then we'll have some tangible proof that this shit was real. Of course, I also realized that, pick or no pick, those alone weren't going to hold up in court. Not considering how much they'd already managed to keep this shit under lock and key for so long, just with a weak-ass story like shark attacks. I was going to need something bolder, something I could actually show to people. Some kind of DNA sample or something from the fish man himself. Well, therein laid the rub, though. How in the fuck was I going to pull that off? To start, it was by pure accident that I came face to face with him last time. Even if I didn't know when and where he'd come back, how was I going to get a fucking DNA sample off him? Well, hey, Mr. Fish Dude, I'm sorry to bother you, but um, could I like have a uh, sample of your spirit or something? Oh, nice biceps, by the way. How much do you lift? Yeah, like I'd be that charming, even to a fish man. Trying to confront him directly, with, that was out, but then what was my next option? Well, the answer to that actually hit me out of the blue. Talk to the stoner kids again. I know, you're probably wondering just how the fuck that was supposed to help. Believe me, at first I was right there with you. But the longer I kept sitting there, replaying the incident in my head the more and more they began to stand out to me. Well, think about it. Sure, most people could have passed them off as just that, dumbass kids, just like how the murders themselves could be easily waved off as shark attacks, or like how just photos of the fish cult on the beach could, and likely would, get waved right off as group cosplay of Lovecraft on the beach, or some cockamimi horseshit like that. But I could see something else. They were there, all of them, giving absolute BS stories. Again, in and of itself, no red flag, until you take into consideration that they likely didn't believe those stories themselves. Uh, they were afraid of me when I wanted to ask them about the murders. Like I'd said before, I just thought it was because they thought I was there to bust them over a little bit of Mary Jane. What if it was something else? What if they too were afraid of me finding out something else? Well, it's a long shot, sure, but... What if, just maybe, they were in on that whole situation? Not only that, but what if, perhaps, they were in cahoots with the trigger-happy cops? Well, the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to start making sense to me. Now, the problem again, though, was just how in the hell was I going to be able to actually prove that? Moreover, what was it going to cost me to do so? It was about 4.30 or so when Nolan showed up at the resort. Hey man, sorry I'm late. Traffic was a bitch. Really? I asked, genuinely confused. Why was there traffic? I mean, this place was barely seeing any patrons. Yeah, he said, sighing. I guess because of the beach party they just tweeted about. My eyes bugged. Beach party? I asked, alarmed. Yeah, didn't you know? The fuck no. He frowned. Ah, Weird. Now, here's the tweet. He held up his phone. It was a tweet with a picture of the beachfront with Sunny Shore Beach Bash hashtag. What the fuck? When was this? <laughs> Just this morning, dude. What's the problem? This place is about to be an all-you-can-eat buffet. That's what. I didn't tell him this, though. He wouldn't have been able to understand. It wasn't exactly here, you know. Ah, uh, nothing, dude. Just, um... Hey... Did you bring your camera? Yeah, both of them. Why? Good. Because we're going to that party. 
Huh? Well, okay, but why? I just looked at him and told him to trust me on this. He held up his hand, relenting. Trust me, if we're unfortunate enough, you'll soon see what I'm talking about come late tonight. Afterwards, Nolan and I got the cameras out and headed to the beach. When we got there, the place was so crowded. It was tough as all hell trying to even get onto the beach, much less actually trying to find a decent spot to snap some photos. All around us were throngs of people, mostly kids and young adults like the stoners, who were moving and dancing all over the beach to the loud-ass music blaring over the speakers. With a bit of shoving our way through, we actually managed to wade through the crowd without inciting an all-out brawl to the shoreline. Nolan started snapping pics of the tide while I kept on the lookout for either the stoners or the cops. And the fact that I hadn't seen either of them there yet only served to heighten my suspicions toward them. Well, shouldn't the cops be there to at least make sure the party doesn't get out of hand or whatever? And the stoners, I mean, this was just basically their kind of party, right? Weed, music, and bikini chicks everywhere. I mean, come on. Unless, of course, they're not just a trio of stone teenagers. I noticed briefly that the music, which had been blaring some sort of trendy hip-hop, had changed a bit. It was a sort of subtle change, one that you'd likely have overlooked unless you were on high alert like I was. It was about midway into the current song that I noticed what sounded like a sort of deep-toned drum pitch starting to crescendo. At first, like I said, because of how well it managed to blend in with the actual music itself, I almost waved it off as just the bass from the speakers acting out. That is, until the beats got louder and louder. Steadily, the drums pounded harder and harder, shaking the ground and reverberating through my body. Listening closer... I noticed these weren't exactly just any drums either. The slow rhythm of the pounding, the rather hollow sound of the drums suggested that they were sort of some kind of tribal drums, similar to what natives used to use. It sounded like there was a lot of deep-throated kind of choral vocalization to it. A sort of call, one you'd expect to hear from a whale, either for mating or for feeding. Hmm. Feeding. Squinting, I looked over to where the music was blaring from. To my shock, that's when I saw that the drums weren't coming from the speakers at all. Over at the far edge of the beach, the two druids from the previous night were standing there, watching the crowd while beating the drums. I looked up to the sky. The sun was nearly down to the horizon, bleaching the sky red. I looked over to Nolan, who was still snapping pics of the sunset. I looked at my phone and caught another surprise. It's only quarter past five. The sun shouldn't have been going down for at least another hour or so. The drum beat really began to pick up then. Still, people somehow weren't noticing. I, however, noticed how the chorus escalated from guttural throat singing to an almost ear-splitting shrieking noise, similar to the ones I'd heard from the mask man the night before. I noticed it was also a little more distance from the beach, despite still sounding so clear, at least to me anyways. I then spotted him, the masked man, standing at the top of one of the lifeguard decks with his arms outstretched. I noticed that he had a staff or something in his hand this time. Whatever the hell it was, it was glowing as well. Oh, what the hell is that? I wondered before crumpling to my knees and covering my ears. Out of nowhere, the masked man's screeching was ringing in my ears so loud, I would have sworn he was taking a power drill straight to my ear. No matter how tightly I pressed my hands to my ears, I couldn't muffle it a single bit. It was like the man's screeching wasn't actually in my ears at all. Like it wasn't actually something I was hearing, but instead something I was sort of sensing, if that makes any sense at all. It was like the masked man was trying to scream at me, but telepathically where only I could hear a damn bit of it, as evidenced by the fact no one else could hear this. The screeching eventually took on a sort of discordant effect in my ears, like it was being passed through a fan or something. That's when I began to hear words, some kind of articulation similar to words, whispering to me. To try and pronounce the actual words themselves would be a fucking nightmare, trust me. 
Just try to imagine what you'd think a mutant fish man with the voice of a snake underwater would sound like, trying to form words, and you'd have an idea of what it sounded like. Understanding or not of what it sounded like, though, I'd have been damned if I had any fucking clue as to what it meant. What was even more nerve-wracking was the question of why I was the only one hearing it. I felt myself being shaken. Hey man, are you okay? A faint voice asked. Because the man's weird screeching was still running rampant, it was almost half a minute before my mind could even register the kid's voice. I looked up to see him standing over me, gently shaking me by the shoulder. I saw others beginning to crowd around me. The screeching slowly dissipated, and I could start to hear the music and chatter more clearly again. I looked around me, seeing at least 25 or 30 people gathered around, staring worriedly at me and whispering, Is he okay? Do we need to get the paramedics out here? Are you okay, sir? repeated the kid standing over me. I looked back up at him, exchanged another passing glance around the group around me, and replied, Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I then slowly made my way back up to my feet with the kid's help, and looked around again. The sky was half dark now. The masked man was still there, standing on the pier, now with his arms by his side. God, what the fuck was happening to me, I wondered. I could see both the masked man and his three druids all facing the ocean. Facing me, almost. Or so it looked and felt, anyways. My heart began racing, and I pushed my way through the crowd to find Nolan. I was stopped again, though, when another roar blasted through the air. This one was deeper and earth-shaking. This time I wasn't the only one who heard it. People everywhere turned their heads toward the ocean where it had come from. I could hear them anxiously whispering and crying out. What the heck was that? Not me, though. I was trying to get to Nolan. I knew what was coming, and I didn't want to be around to see what it would do with the crowd that was gathered there. I found him standing along the shoreline. Hey, Nolan, come on, man. We've got to get out of here now. He didn't move. Nolan, you hear me? Come on. I got closer to him, putting my hand on his shoulder. Dude, what's going- I stopped. Nolan stared straight out to the ocean, his face completely albino and his jaw hanging numbly. Max? He whispered, shuddering in utter fear. What in the name of fucking God is that? I looked out toward the tide again, and then my face went white. Just a few miles out from the shoreline, approaching rapidly, was the largest webbed dorsal fin I'd ever seen, cutting viciously through the water. Jesus, it's here. I turned to Nolan. Listen, take a photo of it, then we gotta get these people off the beach, understand? He stood still. I could feel him quivering in fear. I shook him and said, Nolan, hey, stay with me. You understand? Uh huh? he said, snapping from his trance. He exchanged another look toward the ocean and then back to me. The fin was only a few feet away now. Yeah, he said finally, raising his camera. Yeah, I got you. I turned right as he snapped the photo. Everyone, I shouted. We have to get out of here now. They all stood staring, frightened at me for a moment, like how Nolan was. Come on. Max... Nolan cried from behind me. I spun around and saw that Fishman had risen from the water, and he was leering down at Nolan. Nolan, get out of there. It was too late, though. Nolan had just enough time to spin around on his heel and attempt to run before the fish monster wrapped his entire tenebrous webbed hand around Nolan's head and jerked him backward. I was about to rush over to somehow try and help him, but before I could even take two steps more, the creature had Nolan pressed above its head and, in another flashing instant, effortlessly ripped his head and neck away from his shoulders. That's when the crowd around me finally erupted into a cacophony of shrill screams. All at once, hordes of people began clamoring over each other, frantically fleeing from the beach. I was frozen, paralyzed, and, more than anything, just straight disgusted. I wanted to puke right there and then on the beach until there wasn't anything left in me. 
but at the same time I felt like my stomach, as well as the rest of the muscles in my body, were just frozen. I watched Fishman throw its scaly head back, cramming Nolan's torso into its mouth while hurling his head like a baseball. His head landed just four or five feet away in the sand, immediately being trampled on by the fleeing beachgoers. Fishman let loose another deafening, earth-shaking roar that reverberated through my body like it was gelatin. I finally broke and took that as my cue to haul ass. Obviously, getting off the beach was a nightmare, even more so than getting in. That wasn't just me. I mean, everywhere I looked, some poor bastard or child... Yes, some of them were even actual fucking children. They were all getting stomped into the sand without a second fucking thought. I made the mistake of looking back and saw the fishman approaching, taking huge, lumbering strides like he did before. It wasn't long before he was upon the crowd, grabbing people left and right, and ripping them apart, and roaring to the night sky above. Soon blood and body parts were raining down all over the beach like a monsoon. I did my damnedest to ignore this, as well as the screams of terror and pain that surrounded me, I just tried to push onward. This all proved useless, however, as I couldn't break through the wall of people in front of me. I managed to make it about a quarter to maybe halfway in before I was joining the other unlucky sons of bitches on the ground being trampled on. I couldn't see anything, save for sand and the soles of people's feet stoving my head in. At one point, I was sure I could hear the bones in my arms and my ribcage snapping. I was lying there in the sand, coughing and wheezing, having one foot after another crush the life out of me slowly. Then my vision began clouding over. Darkness crept upon the outlines of my vision. Stomp after stomp rained down on my head. Each time it felt like the next one would finally flatten me. Just before my vision would go out completely, though, I heard and felt Fishman stomping toward me. Fuck, this is it. I blacked out after that, having taken yet another foot to the face. The way I saw it, even if, by whatever miracle, Fishman didn't decide to rip me apart, the constant head trauma would have done me right in. In short, imagine my surprise when I actually woke the fuck up again. Though this brought me no relief when I saw what I'd woken up to. It was pitch dark out. Everything was quiet, still, safe for the tide. I couldn't see anything at first. My head felt like I'd been stuffed by several bricks of lead, and pain made trying to move my body, especially my arms, nigh on impossible. I managed to work my way up to a sitting position and looked around. The wind was still, like it too was just too scared beyond belief to even make a fucking sound. I shifted around, finally and painfully working my way back to my feet. I attempted to stagger forward only to trip and faceplant over a discarded arm or leg. Trying to get up the second time took a bit more effort, but when I did, I heard that weird chorus again coming from far off to the right end of the beach. I looked over to see three figures kneeling down in front of the shoreline, with their arms raised, holding a torch in their hands. Thankfully, I actually still had my camera. For what I could tell, by some divine miracle, it wasn't crushed to pieces. I struggled to stumble closer, trying not to make a noise so I could snap a picture of them. Whoever they were, maybe I should say whatever they were, I wasn't about to leave this place without some kind of proof of them, of what they'd done. So long as they don't see me, as so long as from that point on I kept a reasonably low profile, I'd be able to actually return home with a story for World of Weird. And then... Then at least Nolan and everyone else on the beach, for that matter, might not have completely died for nothing. I managed to get to a distance where I could semi-decently make out their forms, at least enough to where they wouldn't just easily be brushed off as shadows or tricks of the shadows or, I don't know, some sort of horseshit scapegoat for it being anything other than what the fuck I knew it was. Well, sort of knew it was. What? You expected me just to waltz up and ask, Hey, uh, so, uh, you like a cold or something? Oh, fat fucking chance. As far as I could care enough to know who or whatever they were, 
They weren't human, and they weren't friendly. My plan for stealth ended up being blown out of the water, pun intended, I guess, when I snapped a pic of the group, not exactly being careful enough to make sure the flash wasn't noticeable. Maybe two seconds after the pic snapped, one of the hooded druids snapped their head toward me. That was when I was essentially forced to turn and limp away as fast as I could, all while trying not to trip and fall on my face again over other randomly discarded body parts. I guess some small stroke of luck was still on my side, however. Not only was I able to maneuver through without stumbling over anything in the dark, but along the way I came across the glint of something reflective in the moonlight lying in the sand. Without stopping, I snatched it out of the sand, realizing it was Nolan's camera. Beside it was what appeared to be his shredded torso, lying on top of about twenty or so others. Now I'd have whatever pictures he took in his last moments, along with the one I took of the figures. I managed to make it off of the beach. When I was back on the boardwalk, I turned around to see that they actually hadn't followed after me. I was relieved by this, but wasn't taking any chances, so I turned back around and kept going until I made it back to the sweet building. I'll keep in mind that I was running off pure adrenaline by that point, and it was fading fast. I was actually able to make it into my room just before I collapsed onto my bed. Oddly enough, though, I didn't actually fall asleep. Instead, I just lay there on my bed, surrounded by quiet darkness. My joints felt tight. Trying to move any part of my body resulted only in my entire body racking with pain. My mind was essentially a blur couldn't seem to focus on one single thing that had happened. Rather, everything just cycled through my mind, sort of simultaneously like a hive of hornets. Images flashed across my mind like slides on a projector, one that just constantly looped. Every two seconds, my mind was bouncing between scenes of blood and body parts flying everywhere, and the weird sort of call they made right before Fishman even showed up. That got me thinking. What was that exactly? Yeah, yeah, I know. Mating call or whatever, right? But then how come only I could hear it? Why was I the only one that seemed to notice them? And why was I seemingly the only one fishman and the others let go? I mean, the fucker had me right there. A TV dinner, essentially. Multiple times. Yet here I was, still in one piece, likely the only one in Sunny Shore Resort who could say as much. Now, don't get me wrong, I was more than grateful for this. Nevertheless, I still couldn't help but find this both confusing as well as a bit frightening. The only logical explanation I could come up with for why I had been spared was that they had some unknown, probably horrific, purpose for me. One that apparently required me to be alive. My first thought was obviously that I was supposed to be some sort of offering on the part of the cult to Fishman. But then, that's just it. Why had I not been torn apart and eaten yet like the others on the beach? So, okay, that ruled out life sacrifice. So what else was it? I thought again about how the cult also let me go multiple times, at least from what I understood. Why did they let me go? Why was it the only one who could hear their call to Fishman? The other possibility I considered was that I was left alive as a sort of messenger, spared to spread their prophecy or whatever. I would have believed this, except then why did they remove the SIM card from my phone the night before? Not only that, but why me? Why was I apparently so special to them? Especially if they didn't want me to spread the word about them. Plus, the whole beach massacre made absolutely no sense to me that they'd need me alive. Unless... Hmm. Unless... I need you going around trying to spook folks around here when it's clearly nothing but a shark attack. My body went cold. Could that really be it? Is that why they wanted to keep me alive? To try and convince people to come? As much as I hated it, that conclusion began to make more and more sense to me. It would explain why they would want me to be alive despite all that I'd seen. It would also somewhat explain why I was the one their call was directed to. That also put a new thought into my head. What if that wasn't actually a mating call of some sort, but some command? Still, though, this all boiled back down to the question of, why me? How would they have known I'd even be able to tell the public about Sunny Shore Resort? 
What made them think I'd be able to convince anyone to come to the beach? This too clicked in my head not long after crossing my mind. They must have realized I was there to investigate. But how? I mean, it's not like I fucking knew them. Right? That's when I realized I'd been ratted out. She said to give her regards. Everything had now fully fallen into place. It made sense, and it was confirmed after that night. When morning came, I packed my shit up and left Sunny Shore Resort. Didn't even bother with the checkout desk. No, I just kept forward right past New Girl Receptionist and out the door without a single word. But no, I still don't know what the hell happened to tired Tracy. Mrs. Trigger Happy and her partner were outside the suite building, seemingly waiting on me. I say seemingly because they didn't actually try to stop or call out for me or really notice me at all. That was until I got to my car. That's when I heard it again. The weird chorus from the previous night. I was beginning to panic, and when I looked over, they were there, staring daggers at me. They knew I could hear it, just like they knew on the beach that night. Just like they knew I was there to tell a story about the place. This was all back in June. I haven't been back to the place since. If I can help it at all, that won't ever change. As I said at the start, World of Weird has already thumbed its nose up at publishing the article, no matter how much I begged, pleaded, and fought tooth and fucking nail to get them to publish this story, I was hit with the same response. Well, this piece is far too speculative without any concrete evidence to support the allegations presented. Every time I attempted to point them to the photos, including the ones I'd had Nolan send in before he came to the resort, they brushed them off. It was illogical, all of their reasoning but it wasn't long before it clicked in my head as to why. I realized somewhere along the way that the editor-in-chief at the press must have talked with those two cops, who undoubtedly convinced him that I was full of shit. I was told that if I was going to keep my job with the press, I was going to have to return to Sunny Shore and find a more believable story. And as you can imagine, I said, to hell with it all, and left the place for good. I wasn't going to do the cult's dirty work, regardless of if people believed it or not. Since then, I've gotten a job as a cashier at the Mega Mart just a few miles away from my house. It sucks, I won't lie, but the pay is actually a bit better than the bit of cash I was scraping with the press. I still occasionally write articles for various other magazine companies, but I never tried publishing this story again, until now. Last week, while scrolling through my phone at work, I found an article on my Google feed about a fall festival beach bash at Sunny Shore Resort. Immediately I was taken back to the night of the Sunny Shore beach bash. That's when I realized I couldn't give up on this story. Look, believe me here or don't. I get it, this is all a lot to take in and it's bizarre. Believe me, I get it. But if you take nothing else away from this, then take this much away. There's something vicious on the beach at Sunny Shore Resort. It's not a serial killer. And it sure as hell isn't a shark. So another wonderful feature-length story there from Corpse Child. I've actually had that one on the go for more than a year, I think. Um, yeah, it's been more than a year since he first posted that on uh, my subreddit. And it's taken me this long to get around to doing it. Well, finishing it off anyway, because of my... Uh, well, it just seemed like a good time to do it, to tell you the truth. While I was under the weather and I had most of it recorded, I would finish that one off and get a nice feature-length story for you all. This miserable January evening. Well, miserable here anyway. It's very nice in some parts of the world. Anyway, that's... Uh, yeah, that's it for this evening. But do please check out his book. Um, I've left a link in the description and you saw the image at the start of the video go check it out support him if you can that would just be fantastic okay till the next time my dear friends many many sweet dreams bye bye thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today really means a lot to me and to the author of the story of course well you want to know more about me i'm pretty much everywhere on social media you can find me on facebook twitter instagram 
You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.